I have found out beat news in depth for you. Good evening and welcome to Outbeat News in Depth. I'm Greg Morelia. Next month, the Santa Rosa Community Health Centers is presenting the first ever Sonoma County Rural Transgender Community Conference. Dr. Suji is our first guest tonight and will tell us all about this premier event. And then Prop 8 plaintiffs Jeff Cirillo and Paul Katami return to Outbeat Radio to share all that they've been working on in the LGBT civil rights movement following their 2013 defeat of Proposition 8 at the Supreme Court. All this is coming up next, right after your Outbeat Radio news for this Sunday, September 27th, 2015. I have found Outbeat Radio news, your source for LGBT news from the North Bay and beyond. Last Sunday night, Jeffrey Tambor took home the award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Comedy Series at the Emmys for his role in Transparent. The actor who plays a trans woman named Mara Pefferman on the Amazon original series dedicated his award to the trans community in a beautifully and touching speech. This is the first time the actor has won the award, and he made sure to make it count. Tambor said, I've been given the opportunity to act because people's lives depended on it. Thank you for your courage, thank you for your stories, and thank you for your inspiration. Transparent director Jill Soloway also took home an Emmy for outstanding directing in a comedy series. And popular chip maker Frito-Lay announced last week that it's teaming up with the It Gets Better project to launch a limited edition version of its Cool Ranch flavored Doritos. The chips come in pride colors, green, blue, purple, red, and orange, and are branded Doritos Rainbows. Doritos Rainbows chips are a -a first-of-a-kind product supporting the LGBT community. Frito-Lay's chief marketing officer, Ram Kirshnan, said in a press release, Doritos, the brand, has stood for the bold, and we believe there is nothing bolder than being yourself. Predictably, not everybody is happy with the pride-inspired snack. Some folks have taken to Twitter to voice their disappointment with Frito-Lay, calling the chip snacks disappointing, ISIS, and a threat to Christianity. And here in Sonoma County, youth are getting together this month for their very own lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, and intersex film festival. Youthquake, a collection of films created by producers of Outwatch, Wine Country's LGBTQI film festival, includes fantastic short films about fitting in and finding out. A mysterious golden boy finds that he's not alone in Golden. In Gnome, an unusual audition for Romeo and Juliet leads to a new friendship, and a place in the middle honors Hawaii's traditions of respect for all those who live in between the binary genders of male and female. 50% is a performance piece by a Latino lesbian talking about her life. The program is sprinkled with youth-produced films and is sure to inspire and entertain. Jody Lane, one of the event's producers, said, We're excited about exposing the North Bay's young people to these wonderful short films and creating a safe place where they can discuss queer film. We're hoping the event encourages creativity in all those who participate. Youthquake, short films for LGBTQI youth to age 22 and their friends and their family will play at the Arlene Francis Center in Santa Rosa on October 17th. It's free, and there's pizza and soft drink with some sweet treats, too. It all happens from 2 to 4 p.m. at 99 6th Street near Railroad Square. Gay, lesbian, and transgender feature and documentary films will be shown at Outwatch, Wine Country's LGBTQI Film Festival, happening November 6th through the 8th, 2015. They will screen at the Sebastopol Center for the Arts at 282 South High Street in Sebastopol. As part of the weekend, there will also be a DJ dance and an ice cream social. You can buy a pass to Outwatch as well as the VIP party. You can learn more right now at www.outwatchfilmfest.org. Now here's your calendar of events for the coming week. On Monday, September 28th, and every Monday at 5.30 p.m., the Petaluma Health Center will host an LGBT support group at 1179 North McDowell Boulevard in Petaluma. And also on Monday at 5.30 p.m., the Marin AIDS Project will host its Mix It Up monthly mixer at the Four Points Sheridan, 1010 Northgate Drive in San Rafael. For more information about LGBT events happening here in the North Bay, go to GaySonoma.com. And for all the latest LGBT news headlines, go to our website at OutbeatNews.com. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for updates from Outbeat Radio News all week long. For Gary Carnavelli, I'm Greg Moralia. Outbeat Radio News, your source for LGBT news from the North Bay and beyond. 
The transgender community is becoming more visible by the day, especially in light of the media's attention on people like Caitlyn Jenner. But the trans community isn't something new here to Sonoma County, and our first guest has been a champion for the community for many, many years. Dr. Suji is with us now to talk about the first transgender community conference happening right here in Sonoma County next month. Dr. Suji, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on today. Well, this is a really exciting conference coming up, but before we get to that, for those people who haven't met you, and if you're in the trans community, I can't imagine that they haven't met you, but for those who haven't, tell us about your background and the work that you've been doing. Great. Well, I am a family physician, and I did my uh, residency here in Santa Rosa at the UCSF uh, residency program, and I started the transgender uh, clinic about eight or nine years ago now, and I continue to run it. Um, we are located at the Vista Health Center, part of Santa Rosa Community Health Centers. And we, about two years ago, we took on the Latina Women's, um, Latina Transgender Women's Support Group also. So we run the clinic in conjunction with the support group once a month. And this is probably pretty unique for Northern California, right? I mean, I haven't heard of anything like this specifically for the trans community anywhere. In which part? Well, having a clinic and a, and a focused place uh, for this work. Well, there are clinics. There's a clinic in San Francisco that does mostly transgender care. There's, um, there's a bunch of clinics uh, all over the country. We are, as far as I know, we're the only clinic north of San Francisco until you get up um, to, I don't know, until you get into the next state, actually, I think. Yeah. So we get, we get patients coming to our clinic from Sonoma County, Napa County, Mendocino County, Lake County. Um. What a resource to have. So tell us, what was the impetus for a conference? Well, I, as a, as a physician running this clinic, I see patients, I see transgender people from all of these areas, and I realize that people don't actually see each other. Uh, and I was thinking that it would be really great if we had one place where everybody could get together and be able to meet each other and start to actually strengthen and, and help build um, a stronger community. Um, this is a very diffuse community because it's, it's all over these areas. So like if you go to San Francisco, you know, there are areas where people are, more, it's more easy for people to go and meet each other and to like, you know, build the kind of community that, um, that, that you think of as you think about, you know, the, the LGBT community in San Francisco. And, you know, we tend to think that, that stronger communities are much healthier communities. So it's also a health issue in that people who have that kind of support are actually much more likely to have better health outcomes. So as far as being a health issue, it's also kind of important. So uh, that's where I came up with this idea that we should have a a transgender conference and help people uh, bring everybody together who are in all these outlying areas, uh, at least for one day, so they they can meet each other and start working on um, what does the community need and what does the community want to do. Great. Well, gender identity as a whole, and you know, certainly the trans community is getting some, finally getting some well-deserved attention. Yeah. So from your perspective, how have stories, the more famous ones we've heard about, Laverne Cox, now Caitlyn Jenner, how do you think that they've influenced society and how society looks at gender and gender identity? Um, they have both been amazing, amazing people for bringing the... Um, the ideas and the, the, the words transgender to, you know, most of middle America. Um, however, there is still so much further to go, right? Because we're looking at a community, if you're transgender, you can now get married anywhere and not have to worry about whether or not your legal gender is accepted in the state you're in. But you can still get um you can still get discriminated against for being transgender in both um, housing, uh, public accommodations, uh, jobs, uh, pretty much anything in most of the states in the United States. California um, does have a very good uh, transgender discrimination protection law, but I think it's more than 
more than 50 percent of the states in the United States have no protection for transgender people. Yeah. So tell us about the conference. So the conference is going to be on October 17th. Uh, we're really excited. We have Marcy Bowers, who uh, is doing a keynote speech. Marcy Bowers is the first transgender person to, to come to um, start doing transgender surgery. She uh, is a doctor, and she trained with um, the one of the early pioneers in transgender surgery, Dr. Biber, who was in uh, Trinidad, Colorado. And so she now works in the South Bay and also has an office up in, in Seattle and does some really amazing work in um, Africa as well. And we're really excited to have her be the keynote speaker. Uh, she's really inspiring and has such a great, inspiring life story. And then uh, we're going to have, we're going to be able to, we're also having a bunch of workshops where people can learn about um, legal issues and um, social issues and uh, get a lot of really good uh, immediate uh, information that they can use right away as far as like building the community and protecting the community as well as themselves and their loved ones. Uh, we are really excited to have a really great group of volunteer presenters. We're also going to be able to have at the same time, we have a Drug Abuse Alternative Center in Santa Rosa is going to be there. They're going to be able to offer free uh, HIV and hepatitis C tests where you can, meet, you can get your results right at that moment. Uh, we're going to have um, safe sex information. We're going to have information about other um, local uh, resources as well. And... Um, yeah, it's going to be great. It sounds incredible. Just incredible. And who's the conference open to? Uh, the conference is open to people in the transgender community, so it's transgender people as well as their loved ones and families. Um, this is definitely looking, we're looking at, at a trans, is really looking at, a, at this as a transgender community building event. Uh, I have had a lot of uh, uh, interest from professionals, like, um, people who are therapists or attorneys who want more educational um, information. So we are looking at putting together a professional educational conference at some time within the next year. But that's that's definitely a separate. That would be a separate event. So more specifically, this is looking at the transgender community. So how about parents of trans kids? Absolutely. So transgender community. Um, their loved ones, transgender people, loved ones and, and families, completely invited. So we do have um, we do have uh, workshops for both parents and for kids. That sounds great. I mean, gender is becoming such a fluid uh, identity, particularly among young, young people. I'm seeing that at the college all the time, more and more now. Yeah. You know, as people come to understand what gender really means and and seeing that they have the liberty to be able to define gender for themselves how they want it, how they see themselves. So that's really, really cool. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think a lot of people do question whether we're seeing more transgender people in general these days or whether we're actually just seeing people coming out at an earlier age. They think if you looked about, about 10, 20 years ago, you'd see people who were transgender being more in their 30s or 40s or even 50s when they came out before they realized that they did have these options. And um, now we're seeing people in much younger ages realizing they have options and that they can be who they are much earlier. Well, making some progress, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so tell us where people can go to learn more about the conference and register if they wish. Great. We have um, Eventbrite is where our... Um, uh, registration is so if you go to Eventbrite, Eventbrite and look up Trans Life. We're calling this the Trans Life um, Building Our Community, the Sonoma County Rural Transgender Community Conference. So you can easily access us there. And then if you want to follow us on Facebook, uh, we are Sonoma County Rural Transgender Community Conference on Facebook. And if you're interested in 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 need, or if you need medical care and uh, the, you could also call for an appointment at the Vista Family Health Center. Their number is 
staff for an appointment in the transgender clinic. Perfect. And if you miss those websites, we will have them all listed on our own website at outbeatnews.com. You can just go to show notes at the top of the page, click the link, and we'll have them all right there for you. Dr. Suji, congratulations on what's going to be a great conference, I am sure. We'll look forward to hearing how it goes. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Well, we're sure lucky to have someone like Dr. Suji right here in the North Bay. It's going to be a great conference. All right, we have some time tonight for a music break, and I wanted to share with you a song I ran across on the radio. It's original music written by straight ally Greg Holden, and it's called Boys in the Street. Check it out. When I was younger, my daddy told me I would never Never amount to nothing special He'd come at me from every angle He'd say, you're the last thing I wanted The last thing I need How am I gonna answer when my friends tell me My son was kissing boys in the street My son Was kissing boys in the street He tried to change me Say I'm embarrassing my country How could I do this to my family? Do I want to grow up being lonely? He'd say We have worked for our money We've put you in school Is this how you repay us? Do you think this is cool, my son? Stop kissing boys in the street My son Stop kissing boys in the street Daddy's heart's a little warmer But he still won't hug me like my brother And he still won't kiss me like my mother He'd say, you were part of this family I made you myself But the way that you act isn't good for your health, my son Stop kissing boys in the street Stop kissing boys in the street We sit in silence but we're smiling Because for once we are not fighting He'd say There was no way of knowing Cause all I was taught is men only love women But now I'm not sure my son Keep kissing boys in the street My son Keep kissing boys in the street When I'm gone Keep kissing boys in the street If you're just joining us, that was Boys in the Street by Greg Holden. And you're listening to Outbeat News in Depth on KRCB FM Windsor, Santa Rosa. I'm Greg Moralia. Well, Jeff Cirillo and Paul Katami are the two men from Southern California who took part in the battle to defeat California's Proposition 8. 
In 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down that voter initiative, the one that took away marriage equality from California. Jeff and Paul stepped up to the plate and became two of the faces in this LGBT civil rights battle. And since that historic ruling, both have stayed engaged in activism and are continuing to fight for many more of the rights we still lack. Jeff and Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having us. We're happy to be back with you. Well, so much has happened since we last talked after the Prop 8 decision in 2013. And so this is a great opportunity to get caught up with you. But I want to start out by hearing about your wedding ceremony with Ted Olson and David Boyce, the two attorneys from the Prop 8 case, officiating. Well, that was really great. As you know, um, if you've seen the case against Date, or if you're familiar with the Proposition 8 lawsuit, you're, you know that we sort of had, for lack of a better term, a shotgun wedding. We, got, uh, we wanted to be the first couple married in L.A. Chris and Sandy wanted to be the first couples married in San Francisco. So when the Ninth Circuit lifted the stay on marriages in California, we rushed to get married. But um, we're both transplants to Los Angeles. So my family, uh, this is Jeff, by the way, uh, my family's in New Jersey and Paul's family is up in Northern California in the Bay Area. So we really didn't have any family with us. So when we you can imagine that phone call to our, our families having supported us all these years through this lawsuit to say, oh, we're getting married, but you can't be here. Um, they certainly understood, but they said there has to be a big celebration and a, and a big cake. And uh, I had always dreamed of dancing with my mom at my wedding, so we knew we had to do some type of celebration. So, so we thought that on the year anniversary of the ruling, um, which was also the uh, 49th anniversary of Stonewall, 50th mm-hmm. anniversary of Stonewall, um, that uh, no, it wasn't the 50th. no 40. I think it was. Yeah, yeah here <laughs> I am. Now we're mixing our days. Yeah, yeah we're mixing up the day. Um, we had Ted and David come out to Los Angeles, at, surrounded by our families and and uh, friends at the Beverly Hilton, and they officiated our wedding. And it was everything that you ever dreamed it would be. I don't. I don't know as 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 a gay man. I, I know I can speak for Paul too. I think as you grow up, uh, when when marriage is denied to you. You sort of find an ability in your mind to block it out and say, this was never available. This is not available to me. So I can't think about it. Um, So when you did find the opportunity to allow little glimpses of thinking about it, um, it was everything we thought it would be and and such a a great way to bring everybody together and, and commemorate what had been a very long journey. Yeah. Well, I can't even imagine. I mean... And how could you have possibly dreamed about having these two guys, Ted Olson and David Boyce, who we had on the show? I just cannot say enough about how much I admire them. Um, but then to have them be such an integral part of even your journey towards the possibility of marriage and then to actually officiate it for you, it must have been just incredible. You know, it it was incredible in, in many ways. I mean, the, the whole process um, we understood had... Uh, a ripple effect that it would affect, um, you know, potentially millions of people. But we were at the epicenter of our case with Ted and David. They also enriched our lives as individuals. They enriched our lives as a couple. Um, we were we were edified so much on the process of fighting for rights based in the law. Um, and they over and over again, they just kept telling us that this was the most important thing they've ever done in their careers. And just that statement alone, knowing what their careers have been, knowing how respected they are and the volume of work um, that they've done, it was always humbling to us because, you know, Jeff and I never, you know, Jeff and I and Chris and Sandy, we never had any ego about it. We just thought, listen, this is a personal struggle that has been made public so that we can all be treated equally. And here are these two people that are erasing the political lines, erasing this idea of conservative versus liberal on this issue, that we're coming together to show that finally, for once, you know, for once and for all, we had it to affirm our rights of equality based on the Constitution. And so not only were they our lawyers, they became our friends and therefore became came our family over the over the course of the of the case so when it when it came to you know wanting to actually have a wedding and have someone or some people marry us that were really representative of this whole fight and what it meant it, we, when we put the offer out we never expected their schedules to align we never expected them to say yes and they both immediately said yes we will clear our schedules we are there that's terrific and what a what a byproduct from 
what started out as something so so legal and so sort of sterile and 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 I think that story really came through in the documentary too. You could really see the relationship develop between uh really all six of you uh, as you went through that. And I could tell your passion really developed as well and and you two have really stayed very active after your case all the way through to current day. But let's talk about the Supreme Court's decision this last year on marriage nationwide. Uh, what role did you all play in that? For for us, you know, we filed. Uh, we talked with Ted and David and the legal team, and we wanted to make sure we filed a, a friend of the court brief, which is called an amicus brief uh, in the Obergefell case. Um, but we also wanted to make sure we were continuing to talk about it and talk about how important not having those rights would be. So Paul and I have really made an effort to engage on, on many different platforms to make sure that we're continuing to tell not only our story, but the story of the community, the story of our friends and family and coworkers, and making sure everybody understands just what damage is felt every day when gays and lesbians are treated differently. And were you surprised about the decision? Uh, you know, it's funny. We were definitely optimistic, cautiously optimistic, as you always have to be. But you know what really changed our minds in terms of like, you know, feeling just optimism into thinking, I think we're going to win this, is when we listened to the audio of the arguments before the Supreme Court. And the, the arguments against marriage equality hadn't changed. They weren't legitimate. They were based in some kind of phantom idea that marriage equality would hurt the Institute of Marriage. It would cause heterosexual couples not to marry and not to have children. And there was this whole crystal ball argument that, as you and I know, don't, it doesn't hold up in a court of law. So when we tried to search for legitimacy of their side, we just couldn't find any. And, you know, Jeff and I usually come from that. Like, let's listen, you know, with, with open minds and see what they have to say. Here is, you know, we've, we've come a couple of years now since the last set of arguments in terms of this case. And what we're seeing is the same tired propaganda-esque bumper sticker argument that doesn't hold up in court. So and that, at that moment, when we listened to the audio, we thought, wow, I think that, you know, we, we can't lose this. We didn't know how broad the win would be because we really were hoping that there would be an equal protection um, concept to the, to the ruling that would then help us um, really overcome the discrimination of ENDA and, and, and laws like that that really would bring full equality. But we know that any step forward, any major step forward in equality like the Obergefell case and what happened on June 26th of this year um, really helps us move forward and start to break down all the next walls that we need to work on. So, um, yeah, it wasn't. It, we, we felt very optimistic. But after those, there's no legitimate argument. We just haven't found one in all the years we've been doing this. Right. Well, I listened to the tapes as well. And it was really clear that so much of what you all laid out with Judge Walker played a major foundation or provided a major foundation for the big case uh, that we just had. And so you've got to feel really good about that. Absolutely. Judge Walker really had a brilliant idea. No one really, if you know the history of the case, which most people out in California do, uh, there was never supposed to be a trial. So by, by having the opportunity for both sides to put up witnesses, to state their case, and to provide evidence to the court on why um, marriage should either be limited to one man or one woman, or should it be open to all um, citizens in America. And that was what we really thought was uh, the turning point in this whole process, because they didn't really have any credible witnesses. We had the most credible witnesses from all over the world, major institutions who had done years and years of research and were peer-reviewed and had um, authored um, uh, books about these subjects. And it really, really helped to uh, build a foundation for which all of these other cases were, were built upon because Judge Walker had 88 findings of fact in a 136-page opinion and really came down to say, you know what, there really is no reason for this discrimination and, and Proposition 8 ended up being you know, unconstitutional on both equal protection and due process grounds, which was huge. Yeah, very huge. And, you know, you mentioned that the last case in particular, you know, set the stage for what remains. 
But do you get a sense that in the country that there's sort of a, an apathy building now that, well, we've got marriage and so we've won. It's over. Do you, do you all hear that? Yes. And that is our biggest fear. Um, we were recently asked what, you know, our biggest kind of concern is moving forward. And it was exactly what you just said, apathy. It was the settling back and saying, okay, well, now we have won this right for marriage. And so, you know, and now we have social media and the discourse in public opinion that is, you know, telling us that polls are telling us that people are more favorable of equal rights to LGBT citizens. But what lacks in that is the understanding that we still live in a country where in the majority of states you could be married in the, you know, at 10 a.m., you know, to your partner and then fired for that, that afternoon and potentially kicked out of your home for it over the weekend because of being LGBT or how you identify. So the fact of the matter is we had to absolutely hit the gas pedal and accelerate um, on the avenue that we knew would potentially win us the next big battle, and that was marriage. And what it did as a byproduct was bring the stories out and give people more of a network and put the discussion on the front page of the news and on the nightly news and so that people could start talking about those issues in a broader in a broader way. We have to double down now because what we're seeing with these religious liberty bills and all these other uh, factions that are coming out to fight against um, you know, equality for LGBT Americans, um, if we get apathetic and they regroup, we're going to be behind the game on this and we can't be. We have to be educated. We have to be vigilant. Um, you know, Jeff and I just did a little segment, you know, our little Don't Be Dumb at Dinner segment from um, our radio show this Thursday. And a caller jokingly called in and said, well, I don't talk about those topics at dinner. And it was the, it, to exemplify what you just said. It wasn't pop culture, so he wasn't interested. And we kept saying back, you've got to be interested because the fact of the matter is when you go out this weekend, you might find that person that you want to spend the rest of your life with, but your job might take you to a state where you're not protected if you're married. And your cynicism right now, your apathy could lead to damaging your life in the future if you don't just take a moment to engage. And let's not forget, if, if, if I could just put a period on that sentence, sure. right, is – as much as we dislike and disagree with the other side, the other side is smart. They're organized. They've always been organized. They change their talking points. They find what resonates in the area where the discrimination is most prevalent, and they feed on that. And they've already changed the argument. You don't hear anything about really the word marriage anymore. Everything is moved to religious liberty. And that's what everything is about because when you start talking about religion, it really strikes a chord whether you're a, a, a member of the gay and lesbian community or a member of the opposite sex community. So they've really already tweaked these talking points to the point where you see legislators in states in the South especially where they're bringing up these issues and issues that really are phantom issues. They really – they really don't exist. Someone's religious liberty is already protected if you're a member of the church or the clergy with the First Amendment. But if you choose to um, have a public accommodation and you open a business, you have the responsibility to serve everyone that comes into your establishment. Yeah, those are all amazing points. And you know, the part that people don't really understand, particularly if you live in California where we have all the protections, is that in 29 states – the scenario that you just described about getting married at 10 a.m. and then being fired at 11 is a reality. Right. Uh, and so I totally agree with you. I think that, that it, we are in a very dangerous spot. And the religious argument, of course, is much broader than saying, you know, we don't believe that two people should be able to get married. It's about we believe, based on religious liberties, that, you know, owners have a right to fire people if, that they don't want working there or that, uh, if you have housing that we, based on religious grounds, don't believe that we have to rent to everybody. And that's a very, very dangerous, dangerous situation for sure. It's a slippery slope. Absolutely. Because here's, this is my problem with this is that what, how do you, what's the filter? 
right? If a same-sex couple comes to the county clerk's office, they're very obviously a same-sex couple looking for a license or a wedding cake or fl flowers or photography, whatever it might be. Whatever the service that the public accommodation is, it's very clear that it's a same-sex couple. But I'm pretty sure that that clerk or baker or florist isn't going to look at a straight couple and say to them, are you atheists? Are you Muslim? Did you wear leather here today? Because all of those things go against my biblical belief and I cannot serve you then. I mean, it's a slippery slope because it takes us right back in history to separating water fountains, separating lunch counters, it's separ you know, segregating schools, segregating the military, um, not allowing voting rights. I mean, it just absolutely is archaic in thought because ultimately, if you own a public accommodation, and that's what we're seeing right now, this kind of religious liberties in terms of people who don't want to service LGBT Americans because they have a fundamental strong belief in faith that, they're, they, that they shouldn't. Um, that there's a definite line between the public and the private. Your private life and your religion and your thought and your theology is absolutely protected and you're absolutely protected by all of the amendments and our constitution to preach that. You can even proselytize that because you have the right to do that. But the fact of the matter is when you own a public accommodation or you try to enact public law based on that faith and, and, and all it is is bias and discrimination based in faith, that's why we have this straight line between separ the separation of church and state. It, is, it cannot be any clearer that that separation needs to be upheld because the Constitution then becomes the shield to protect those who don't share the same faith from the Bible. And so we need that protection because... You know, I might be Catholic, you might be Christian, Jeff might be Muslim. We we can all live in harmony this year in, in this country because of that protection. You already have those protections. And it's hard to come to the table when you're the underdog and you're not protected to try to have a debate about that. I think that if you want to have the debate, let's continue to have it. But we've got to come to the table equally protected. Right. And that's the part of the Constitution that... You know, the religious zealots sort of overlook. They had this idea that faith reigns supreme, almost a federalist sort of idea around religion and the Constitution. But but that separation is clearly stated there, and, and that's an important point. Let's shift the gears a little bit and talk about your journey into radio. Uh, I heard you on satellite radio first, I think, with Lance Bass on his show, and then yeah. you had a segment called The Husbands. Talk about where this idea came from. Well... Paul and I felt it was important to stay active, and so much happens in our community through social media on a daily basis. You're seeing story after story from not just major cities in America, but small towns, um, and we wanted to make sure we were talking about these things, and because there's so much information, we thought, what a way to um, stay active than by uh, distilling some of these stories down into some of the key ones of the week. So we worked with... Um, with Lance and, and on his Dirty Pop show on Sirius on OutQ. And then ultimately, we're given the opportunity to do a special series on OutQ called The Husbands. Um, we ran for six weeks. And after that, we've transitioned now over to the Universal Broadcasting Network, ubnradio.com. Um, and we still, now we continue to host The Husbands. And we do a segment called Don't Be Dumb at Dinner. And it really takes five of these stories, which we feel, in our opinion, are really key stories. And, and some of them are very newsy with regards to politics and equality. Some of them are pop culture. Um, but they're all important to our community in one way or the other. And it reminds people that in our busy lives, if we're going out and having a drink or we're going to dinner with friends and some of these subjects come up, you now can, you can now uh, speak intelligently uh, from an informed opinion yes. that come from Paul and Jeff. We're basically killing apathy by informing people to be engaged and enlightened and also entertained. I mean, we... And enraged. And enraged, <laughs> many times enraged, because we do pick a whack job of the week, um, and we do expose the hypocrisy of uh, many people's either anti-gay rhetoric or stance in politics, um, and so it's just a matter, you know, we, it all, it all kind of started when we were having dinner with friends and catching up and bringing up subjects and people kind of looked around the table, 
um, and would change the subject if they didn't have anything to say about it. So we figured what a great way to just quickly inform people so that they could either bring up a subject for dinner um, or encourage discussion about a particular subject so that they could um, have some information. And so it's great. We get a lot of people who, who, who stop us and say, I rely on your information on a weekly basis so that I can uh, not be dumb at dinner. That's great. And, you know, I think with, with sort of the mainstreaming that's going on with neighborhoods, uh, as, as an example, you know, having LGBT specific shows and places where young people can go to learn um, and the older folks can stay connected and engaged and, and knowledgeable about those topics is really important. I would hate to see, you know, that all sort of go away or become integrated fully in all the other mainstream media. So it's great. I mean, what's it been like for you? Have you had fun doing it? It sounds like it when I listen. Well, we self-produce it. So it really is something that we find um, therapeutic for us. You know, we, we have an, it gives us an outlet to talk about these issues and some of them with a lot of pride, some of them with a lot of frustration and anger. Um, but it's important that we're talking about them and we're keeping the issues on the front page. So much happens in a 24-hour news cycle that we need to make sure that um, that we do stay informed. And if I, you know, growing up, I mean, I'm 41 years old. If I had a radio show like ours, like yours, podcasts we could go to, uh, gay straight alliances in school, what you see now in a, in, in a majority of the country, I'm not saying it's easy everywhere, but if I had these outlets, I wonder how my life may have been different. I came out when I was 30, still my biggest regret. I really think that if that I had the the information available to me now that's out there, I probably would have come out earlier. So, uh, like I said, just to reiterate that we understand it's not easy everywhere, but we're trying to reach as many people as possible through our show, and hopefully it, it gives them some information and some courage. That's fantastic. Well, I, I applaud you. I think the more that we have, the more media that we have out there, and the more visibility, uh, and the further that our voices can be heard, the better. And speaking of media... Uh, let's talk about this video that this Catholic group produced about marriage equality that really mocked the coming out process. Let's, let's listen to the audio and then talk about it. I am a little bit nervous about people um, kind of hearing that I am this way and then thinking, um, oh, well, she, you know, she's not welcome here. <laughs> I would say I am different. <laughs> We're all different. Most people probably think I'm already weird anyway, so I mean, I don't think society's impression of me is going to change drastically based on one or two discoveries that come to light after this video or... Pretty scary, you know? You, you wonder, how many people can I really, truly, honestly be open with? I've tried to change this before, but it's too important to me. I actually think marriage is between a man and a woman. I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. I already have an idea of what marriage should be. That will never change. At the end of the day, I think we don't need to truly be ashamed of how we really feel about things, so just be you. No one should be looked down upon. No one should be suppressed, or no one's views should be suppressed. I know a lot of people who are gay. I have friends who are gay. I don't fear them, you know? They're wonderful people. I love them. What I do feel insecure about is speaking from the heart and being really open and honest about what I believe. I mean, I love my friends. Several of them happen to be gay. How would it not be the case that the ever-loving creator who gave us everything we have doesn't love us? Where's that balance? You know, where can you say, no, I'm not going to be a part of this, but still respect someone. Bigoted is a huge word that gets thrown around. It's just not true. You cannot have a society of hatred or a society of bigotry. I happen to know what marriage is, and I don't see how it could change. The best way to kind of break down all of these barriers, sorry, <laughs> is to just get to know people one-on-one. -on -one. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not 
yeah, uh, you know, Jeff and I can't stop. <laughs> That's the problem when we see stuff like that. Um, CatholicVote.org put out a, a, a video called um, You're Not Alone, and it used coming out as a vehicle to express their fear about coming out in favor of marriage between uh, being between a man and a woman, one man and one woman. So it was a, it, like you said, it was horrific. It was absolutely insulting. There was no way of not looking at this and saying you are absolutely mocking the idea of coming out uh, for your own use. And listen, we don't, I mean, there is no righteous ownership of what coming out means for LGBTQ com the community. But if you look at our history, you know, it's about that. It is about our struggle. It is about trying to, you know, create a freedom of living your truth in your community. And, and, and it just, it made us so angry. And it also you know, reminded us that there's so much work to be done to continue to combat these ideas that, the religious, the righteous definition of, of marriage is the only one and that it should trump all laws um, that we all live by so that people should be prohibited from having the same rights. So it, it's but what's funny and slightly ironic is that Jeff and I got involved with the whole Prop 8 case because we made a response video to Maggie Gallagher and the National Organization for Marriage and we put it on YouTube and it created this big stir. Um, so we figured let's get some friends together including our friend Lance Bass, um, Ronnie Kroll from the Friend Movement, Shane Bitney Crone from Bridegroom, um, Reverend Susan Russell from All Saints, and Bria and Chrissy from YouTube uh, fame, and just said, you know, if you guys are interested, we just want to, you know, it's, it's almost a, an exercise, in a kind of a therapeutic exercise of like speaking out against this type of propaganda, and they all immediately agreed, and literally, I mean, it took, I mean, we literally turned this around fairly quickly, um, and just put together a response that we called hashtag truth trending and focused on the truth of the matter, the truth of what coming out means, and that if truth trends, it trumps all of these messages um, that someone's faith should apply to the law that we all live by. Well, we've got the audio from it. The video is definitely worth seeing, but let's listen to the audio now. Living your truth is something that all of us should feel safe in doing, regardless of our faith or who we love. We have to come out over and over again every day in many different situations, each time not knowing what the response will be. Each time wondering what level of risk is involved, simply to live our truth and pursue equal treatment, equal rights, and equal access to liberty and freedom. We still live in a country where I can be married to my wife on Friday, lose my job on a Monday, and be kicked out of my home on Wednesday just for how I identify. There is a clear separation of church and state. It protects your right to practice your faith. But it doesn't give you the opportunity to enact laws that punish us just because we don't share your faith. Jesus said, love thy neighbor. Not love thy neighbor unless your neighbor is gay or lesbian, bisexual or transgender. And you don't love your neighbors by denying them the same equal protection that you're guaranteed by the Constitution. Marriage has changed so many times over the course of our history, and it comes with certain civil rights that should be afforded to all Americans, regardless of their faith. My faith tells me the truth will set you free, and the truth is nobody has the right to confuse their theology with our democracy. Judgment, bias, and righteousness feel oppressive, and that oppression is discrimination, and to many, that discrimination is bigotry, whether it's in faith or not. Getting to know people one-on-one -on -one is a way for you to learn that our history of discrimination and oppression is real. Should I be treated differently under the law simply because I don't share the same faith? We are open to meaningful discussions, but we should come to the table equally protected. And not at a disadvantage because someone believes their faith should apply to the laws that affect us all. We have learned from history that when equality spreads wider to include more people, so does dignity, respect, and freedom. I believe in equal rights. I believe in equality. I believe in equal protection. Your truth is trending. My truth is trending. Our truth is trending. What response have you gotten from people? Lots of positive responses because it's they talk about how 
the video that we made is respectful in, it, in its response and really just points out facts. And lots of times facts are missing in, in these other videos and that's really important because when people are seeing these clips on social media uh, and, and sitting there and watching something for two minutes, they're believing what they're seeing because they're assuming it's true. Just like political ads on TV, you, you make an assumption that what you're hearing is true. Um, but lots of times they're not and they're misrepresented in some way. So uh, all of the overwhelming feedback has been positive, um, just thanking us for reminding people what the truth really is and, and really making sure that we pointed out that, that coming out is not something to be mocked. It's a very thoughtful and emotional process for people that, like I said, I did it later in life and there's people that do a lot later than me. So um, we should never mock that. We should, we should want to support that. Yeah, it's such a struggle for folks, even today, even with all the perceived acceptance that's out there, it's, it still can be a really, really painful process. I mean, I, I see that, I witness it all the time in, in the students I have in my classes, mm. uh, who, you know, are in an LGBT studies class, for example, and still, you know, surrounded by the most safe environment, quote unquote, that you could imagine, they still really have a hard time. And, and so, yeah, I agree with you. It's something we need to respect. Well, you know, you two have really busy lives. You have jobs, you have your careers, and yet you're still staying very involved in, in all of this activism. Where do you see it going for you? Where, where do you want to take it? Well, the, we, what we call the accidental activism. Well, we've always been um, a couple. I mean, we're going on 15 years together, and I think from the get-go, I've always been um, together in an effort to be educated, educated and also to go out there and to do what we can in terms of supporting our community. Um, you know, Jeff and I, have, I think we can, together we understand that this entire process, especially at how amplified it was during the Prop 8 case, is the fire that was in us was really starting to roar. I mean, we really then started to feel like, you know, if there was a way to dedicate more of our lives to activism or at least to advocacy, that we we would, that we would not um, not take any opportunity to speak out, to tell our stories, to align with an organization or a group or a project that just continues to encourage people to be dedicated to their truth, to come out, to, to find a network of support, to continue to be visible because we understand the power of all those positive impressions. If you know someone who's gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender, then you're more likely to have the discussion and, under, and, and change the hearts and minds of so many people. And let's not forget, too, and, and this is probably a very overused term this, type of, this time of year, is the next election is the most important election. We say that all the time. You hear that all the time. And sometimes I think it falls on deaf ears. Um, but this one really has a lot at stake, this next one. And, and the presidential election in November of 2016 is going to be um, really important with regards to a couple of things. You have the Equality Act that's going to linger in Congress now which really um, takes all of the discrimination that remains in the LGBT community and puts us under the, the, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I think that um, that's going to languish there because of the current state of the Congress and who's, who's in control, and that's the Republicans. We need um, a Democratic progressive candidate like Hillary Clinton, whoever it's going to be, not only in the presidential level, but it, we need to make sure we're electing senators and representatives who, who are um, representative of, of our, our community and what we're looking for with regards to equality. You have another bill in Congress called the First Amendment Defense Act. Well, who would not want to support that? But exactly. again, it's, it's, the, it's the, the right wing of, of our country clouding um, what the bill's true intention is by putting a really pretty name on it. So we need to be informed voters, we need to be active voters, we need to be talking to people about this election, because this election will also most likely yield one, two, maybe three Supreme Court justices, especially if a re-election is involved with the president who wins. So it's really so many um, rumblings that will come out from this election that we need to make sure that we're out there and we're informed and you don't have, it doesn't have to be labeled activism. It just needs to be lab labeled as engaged. You need to be an engaged citizen. 
Right. Good point. And you need to participate. It's not just about sitting back and, and complaining. It's about getting out and actually casting a vote. Right, right, because we find that exactly that, and Jeff has said it on many occasions, that, you know, Proposition 8 resulted in a major movement in terms of engagement because there was a lot of apathy before this. And I think we were resolved to feeling we would never win because the strategies up until that point were this lengthy, incremental type of strategy that we felt, well, we may never see this in our lifetime. But the minute that we were then kind of shown up by the other side, once again, we finally banded together, stood up, like we've seen in history, where communities come together to take a stand to say, we will not be treated this way anymore. So, I mean, again, we, we ride the wave, and as it ebbs and flows, we have to make sure that we continue putting the efforts in to make sure that, yes, Jeff and I wanted to get married. We are now fully protected in the state of California as married citizens, but if we were to relocate for work, as we mentioned earlier, we could lose some of those protections. We could lose our right to work. We could lose our right to housing. And so we have to continue spreading the message that we to be engaged means to tell your stories. And I say this a lot on our show. I said that the, the kind of trinity of efforts for us as LGBT community is to use your stories to inform people and change hearts and minds, to use your money to support organizations and companies that support us, and to also use your voting power to make sure that we vote people in that will always secure our rights as Americans. Very well said. The Trinity. I like it. So, yes. <laughs> so what about for you two personally? You've been together for 15 years. What's, uh, what's, what's up in the future? Any talk about children maybe? <laughs> you talked to my mom before you called us? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, um, right now we're just, uh, we've got our French bulldog and, and that's really what, what we're focused on. Uh, we're, we haven't really uh, gotten to the point where um, children are in the equation yet. We've thought about it. We are considering it. But right now we're still so busy um, with, our, with our engagement with the community and, and the activism, um, our jobs. But hopefully at some point we may settle down and say it might be time to have some little Pauls and Jeffs. <laughs> Exciting. He used the plural. Did you hear the plural there? I, you know, I did note that. I did note that. I'll make sure and report that back uh, to the, the future grandparents. Fantastic. Well, uh, tell us where we can go to hear your radio show and to see your YouTube channel. Well, we are finally active on social media more than we've ever been. Um, we are on Twitter at Katami Zurillo. Two R's and two L's. Two R's and two L's. Jeff would be remiss if he hadn't mentioned that. Um, we are also we also have started a fan page on um, Facebook, which is Paul Katami and Jeff Zarillo. Um, currently, the radio show is on ubnradio.com, and it's also available uh, via podcast. You can subscribe via podcast on iTunes. If you just search for Paul Katami and Jeff Zarillo, we come up as the husbands. And um, yeah, we're just continuing in that direction. Direction. Great. And your show airs when? Sundays at 10 a.m. Perfect. You can tune in to the husbands at 10 a.m. on Sundays in the morning and then to Outbeat Radio at night that same day at 8 p.m. Fantastic, guys. I'm really proud of you and appreciate all that you're bringing to this important discussion. Pleasure for, ha for having been here. Jeff Cirillo, Paul Katami, thank you again. We'll keep up with you and hope to have you on again soon. Thank you, Greg. And that brings us to the end of our hour. My thanks to our guests tonight, Dr. Suji, Jeff Cirillo, and Paul Katami. Next month, I'll be traveling to Denver to bring you live coverage from the 2015 Matthew Shepard Foundation Honors Event. Tune in next Sunday night to Outbeat Radio's Living Proof with Sheridan Gold and Dr. Diana Grayer. That's at 8 p.m. and only here on KRCB Radio. In the meantime, have a great week, and thanks for spending your Sunday night with us. Outbeat News in Depth is hosted and produced by Greg Moralia exclusively for KRCB Radio. You can listen to our shows on demand on iTunes and on our website at OutbeatNews.com. And be sure to follow us all week long on our Facebook page and Twitter feed for the latest LGBT news from here in the North Bay and beyond.
You're listening to KRCB FM Windsor Santa Rosa Radio 91 online all the time at krcb.org. It's 9 p.m. Stay with us. Open Space District is next.